The three year time skip has arrived, and the manga is now called Boruto 2 Blue Vortex. And given the fact that most of you didn't watch the anime, and no one in the community blames you that you didn't, it's the perfect time to go into the entire story of part 1. We will explain all the key details that will feature in the new manga, getting you caught up to everything. Starting with Boruto now being an outlaw, the boy who killed Naruto Uzumaki. This is due to Ada's omnipotence, which has reversed the roles of Kawaki and Boruto, making Kawaki the son of the 7th Hokage, and Boruto the outsider who betrayed the trust of everyone. Everyone. The story sets up the inevitable clash between these two brothers. So, let's go back in time. Boruto started off as a privileged, snotty brat. Being born as the son of the 7th Hokage, it meant his life was the exact opposite of Naruto. Boruto was surrounded by family, friends, a village that loved him, and most importantly, there was no such thing as Swinkun. Above all else, he had a great relationship with his dad. Naruto would train Boruto, play games with him, and do anything a great father needs to be. However, that was until Naruto became more busy with his duties as Hokage. As a result, Boruto became resentful and would do almost anything to earn his father's attention. In chapter 1, we witness future Boruto narrating his own story, in which he admits that in the past, whilst growing up, he didn't give a damn about being a ninja, and that his story began when he was a brat, who sulked about his dad not paying enough attention to him. Funnily enough, if you didn't know this, this dynamic was actually based on Kijimoto's own relationship with his sons. He wanted to depict his own story through his characters. Due to this writing process, the first 66 episodes of Boruto explore the mental state he's in when he's just around 8 years old, eventually becoming 13. Boruto would enlist in the Shinobi Academy, alongside the other members of the new generation, with the goal of becoming a strong ninja to earn his dad's attention. This is where he'd meet Sarada, a childhood friend, and later Mitsuki, a transfer student from the Sound Village who is a bio-engineered son made by Orochimaru. These guys came with their own childhood trauma by the way, like Sarada having no father around and being the only Ochiha that needs glasses. And Mitsuki is looking to gain a true conscious and also learn what it means to be human. To fulfill his true purpose since Orochimaru is his mom and dad at the same time, he was created in a lab and died many times over to pass a test to become Boruto's moon. That escalated quickly. But together, they'd go on to become the new Team 7. However, way before then, even at his young age and with no training, a powerful ability would be brewing inside of Boruto. An eye unlike anything we had ever seen, which Boruto used to detect the evil influence of Nue, a powerful kaiju created by Danzo's root division from Hashirama cells. This eye would later become known as the Jorgon. Pure eye. This sh Woo! This is so good. Bruh, okay. <clears throat> I got a little too excited. But Hashirama cells? Really? Again? Yeah. And this isn't even the last of it, as there are multiple arcs in Boruto that have them yet again. During his beginning semester at the Shinobi Academy, Boruto would use this power to track down the ghost of Konoha, the one responsible for these heinous acts of terrorizing the people, making their darkest thoughts come out, causing them to act violently. Boruto thought he may have had the Byakugan and asked Naruto to visit the Hyuga clan to test him. However, after sparring Hanabi, they determined he didn't have it. However, the pure eye kept activating to the point where he had a dream of Tonori. After warning him, Boruto is dubbed the Star of Hope that must save the world as the arrival of the gods is coming to destroy the planet. Elsewhere, Kinshiki informs Momoshiki about abnormalities committed by Kaguya, leading them to prepare to depart to Earth. However, brushing this aside, 
for a moment. After investigating further, Boruto eventually discovers the culprit wreaking havoc is none other than Sumire. Nue was passed on to Shigaraki's daughter with the intention to spread chaos in Konoha. This would mark the beginning of a reoccurring theme in Boruto's life, of those he believed to be close to him betraying his trust as this is exactly what Sumire had done. She saw herself as nothing but a tool for revenge, thus unleashing Nue upon the village. However, with the use of the pure eye, he opened a portal to another dimension, where he was able to defeat the rampaging monster, whilst also convincing Sumire to put an end to her vengeance, instead returning back to them to walk her own path in life, rather than following the one her father pushed upon her. He even did this for Denki and all the other ninja in his class, who had similar troubles dealing with their resolve to pursue their dreams. In parallel, Boruto desires to escape the shadow of being nothing more than just the Hokage's son, instead desiring to carve his own destiny. Moving us on to the Miss Village arc, where there's a Walmart version of the legendary Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. These guys want to start a war. Okay, let's see how strong they are. Can they beat Naruto, Sasuke, everyone? Alright, let's see. Oh no, they lost. Oh wow, they lost to Team 7. They can't even beat Chojuro. <laughs> anyway, Boruto makes a friend named Kagura here, who is the son of the previous Kage, who was brainwashed by Obito to do disgusting things. Plus, the history of the Mist Village isn't so great. Boruto learns everything about the history and realizes how important his father is to create the peace that he did. And that sums up that arc. This moves us on to the Genin graduation arc, where eventually Boruto would graduate from the academy after taking on the same test Naruto had done all those years ago. The bell test. It's here that Boruto's told he already has the skill of a chuni. And since he has main protagonist energy, of course he was going to pass. However, Kakashi also had to spill some cold hard truths to the young prodigy. His cockiness was exactly the reason why Kakashi said Boruto couldn't be a true shinobi. After all, he knew better than anyone the position Boruto was in, as he too was a genius of his time. Similarly, he was also full of arrogance and self-righteousness, but it all changed after the death of his best friend. Thus, in order to stop Boruto going down the same path, resulting in the death of those close to him, he opened Boruto's eyes to the importance of collectivism. Because of this, Boruto apologizes to the class for his selfish plan, and they then all bind together and learn the same lesson every ninja has to learn. In the ninja world, those who break the rules are scum, but those who abandon their friends are worse than scum. So following Naruto's footsteps, Team 7 learned that ninja are not tools to be used as objects. As a result, Boruto gets his headband and is officially dubbed a shinobi. Well, actually, for now at least. Back where you friend started, Weiji. <laughs> He's then assigned to be a member of the new Team 7, with Konohamaru as their sensei. Yay! He's actually trash. <laughs> At this point, Boruto was still as adamant as ever to gain his father's attention. When he initially joined the academy at 8 years old, the very first thing he had to deal with was everyone calling him Naruto's son and living in his shadow. Although both father and son performed the very same mischievous acts such as painting or destroying the Hokage monument, amongst, you know, many other pranks, the reasons for doing them were different. Naruto did it for acknowledgement and attention from anyone since he was all alone, whilst Boruto did it to be rebellious to his father for not doing the same thing. During this time, Naruto assigns them for their first mission against bandits. The shinobi attack the village to pressure a girl named Kiri into handing them the deed to the village's bridge. After discovering Kiri was abducted during the incident, Team 7 met with the perpetrators to exchange the deed for her. After the exchange, 
occurred. The corrupt shinobi, Hadairi and Ashimaru, decided on killing them all, prompting Konohamaru to toss the Genin in fleeing with Kiri. Kiri then gives her backstory, where her father was the strongest in town, helping everyone under him, dealing with these type of issues like a true leader. Without him, they are all nervous. This reminds Boruto of his own dad and the responsibilities he has, which Sarada and Mitsuki proceed to tease him due to the attitude towards Naruto he had at this point of time. So whilst they are trying to save this girl Kiri, they are pursued by Ashimaru. The Genin then engage the missing Nin, defeating him using the Boruto stream with Mitsuki and Sarada's raw power. This was the first display of their teamwork that resulted in a successful mission. In fact, their success continued by stopping the Byakuya gang whom were a group of thieves formed by a guy named Gecko. Who? Well, it should now be from the land of snow. What's the land of snow? Heck do I know, but every new fodder that gets introduced in this series ends up from a land that fans never heard of. For all I know, there's a land of the waifus, land of the trash, land of the peaks. But on a serious note, Land of the Snow was introduced in Naruto the movie Ninja Clash Land of Snow. Did you watch that one? No. Gecko stole from the rich and then sold the goods in an effort to distribute the proceeds to the poor in remote areas, leading to them being regarded as noble thieves. Their actions have ultimately led them to gain much support from NPCs in Konoha. However, it was all a lie. In truth, the gang was a ruse by Gecko, who was building up a group of followers that would ultimately aid him in becoming rich himself. They robbed from the Konoha bank and multiple stores. They led the public to believe that wealthy groups and organizations are evil that take advantage of the less fortunate, pretending to be Robin Hood. But their main goal was to distract the military force of Konoha, making NPCs protests against the rich companies, whilst the gang went to get the Magnum Opus. The Magnum Opus is a scientific ninja tool, which is a storage device that contains a record of every ninjutsu in the shinobi world, including Hiden and Kake Genkai in the form of data. Due to this, it's considered valuable enough to sell for a fortune. Let's not forget, like bruh, if you had this tool, you're probably the top 5 ninja in the entire series. That's how OP it was. Team 7, however, managed to defeat them and capture all the members. However, Gecko, with this tool, tried to escape until Lagok, the main man, Naruto speed blitz the train like Minato to send this bitch to prison. And it was epic. Mwah. This all links to Boruto 2 Blue Vortex, as in chapter 1, the geopolitics is highlighted with Shikamaru, stating the public being against Boruto due to being given false information. Knowledge is power, after all, and omnipotence has made everyone believe in the wrong idea. However, at the end of the day, Naruto is a story of someone that had everything to gain, whilst Boruto is a story of him losing everything. These layers peel off bit by bit as the arcs go on. Losing his father's love and attention affected him deeply, but it was a tough lesson he learned to accept to deal with these emotions due to what Momoshiki has planned for him later on. And so, the perfect opportunity to prove his worth was about to present itself. The tuning exams. In order to help prepare for it, Boruto would train on the Sasuke, who tells him he would take him as his student if he were to master the Rasengan. Unknown to everyone though, things were about to change forever, as the peaceful world Naruto had fought to unite was on the watch list of Urishiki, Kinshiki, and Momoshiki Otsuski, the three beings that Kaguya herself was afraid of. Their goal was simple, extract Naruto's chakra and cultivate their own fruit from the divine tree, accomplishing the Otsuski main goal of universal dominance and achieving godhood. They weren't the only ones meticulously crafting plans though, as the mysterious organization known as Kara made their first steps towards what would eventually cultivate into a war on Konoha. The legendary war veteran, Ao, had survived the Tail Beast bombing and subsequently 
subsequently began a new life with Kara, feeling indebted towards them for saving his life with their ninja tech. Thus, he placed a Konoha scientist known as Katasuke under a genjutsu, forcing him to leak valuable data on technological advancements to Kara. Meanwhile, Boruto continues to train, and during this time, the hatred for his father becomes even deeper, as Naruto would end up missing even his daughter's own birthday by sending a shadow clone in his place. Now, obviously as Naruto fans, we're all scratching our heads over here, because Naruto of all people should be able to understand what it's like to have nobody around. Plus, doesn't this guy have unlimited chakra? That's why it took Momoshiki too long to take it out of him. Why couldn't a clone do the work in the office and the real Naruto stay at home to enjoy Himawari's birthday? So, let's call it as it is. This was the very writing plot device that upset a lot of fans that defamed the GOAT at the time. He's out of line, but he's right. Anyway, this moment pushes Boruto over the edge. Thus, he decides to use Ninja Tool technology that was banned for the tuning exams. The Kote are machines that rely on technology rather than the hard work and practice that goes into becoming more powerful. But Boruto believes that if he won the tuning exams, then finally his father would see his skills and be proud of him. The technological advancements is a huge theme in Boruto. As the writers admitted, they are exploring the good and bad use cases of society, moving on to a new era with it. The tools give advanced este jutsu to anyone to be able to perform. However, with so much power in anyone's hands, how can it be regulated or controlled for the use of good? Humans that rely on machinery restrict themselves from growing as a person. Jiraiya made it very clear that pain is what makes us understand Understand each other, as pain is a feeling we all share. Therefore, ninjas know the hard work and responsibility that comes with their power and how it should be used. But does a machine? This is why some of the anime arcs explore the idea of new bandits arising in multiple villages, using technology to commit crime, which the ninjas now have to deal with to protect their society from collapsing. Eventually, Boruto learns this harsh lesson in a later arc as he realizes that morality is great and so is technology. Sasuke and Naruto told him this. It depends on the user of the technology that makes it evil. But going back to Momoshiki's invasion for a second, Boruto continues his Rasengan training where he subconsciously adds lightning release and achieves something no other ninja in history has been able to do, successfully creating the vanishing Rasengan. This is why Sasuke brings Boruto along to fight Momoshiki as he witnesses his potential and desire to prove himself as a ninja. Seeing as though Boruto's conversations with him proved that he misunderstood his father Naruto, Sasuke wanted him to gain insight into his father. Before the exams, Naruto encourages his son with a fist bump but gets air. He receives nothing in response bruh. How can you do that to my girl? I would hug the dude. However, during the exams, Boruto would be found out. After cheating, he reached the finals in a 1v1 against Shinki, the son of Gara. The two clashed and Boruto displayed the strength to not only equal Shinki, but even begin to crack his iron sand. However, his patience ran out with the fear of losing consuming him. Boruto then surpassing his limits and believing in himself to win, he took a shortcut using the forbidden ninja tech to use Kakashi's purple lightning jutsu. Naruto had been so proud of his son the whole time. Let's not forget, he trained him before even becoming Hokage and thought he knew better. But now, Boruto was cheating. He was heartbroken to see this and felt betrayed. Because of this, Naruto takes away Boruto's headband and stated that he is no longer a ninja. But we don't have time to mope too long as Momoshiki, Kinshiki and Urushiki arrive, kicking everyone one's asses. Naruto does his best to protect his son and activates his powers. He sacrifices himself, allowing the trio of Utsuski to begin extracting his chakra. In this moment, Boruto has a ninshu connection with his father, experiencing all the sacrifices, emotions and memories he shared with him. He didn't know how powerful Naruto was and realized his father was 
willing to put everything on the line to protect the village. Naruto's life didn't matter because he truly loves Boruto. His job as a father is perfectly encapsulated with his responsibilities. Boruto's immaturity blinded him from seeing these qualities. So whilst Naruto is getting his chakra taken away, Boruto decides to go with Sasuke and the other Kage to save him. This is because whilst Boruto believed he had failed in creating the Rasengan, running off because he felt like a failure, Sasuke realized he had actually achieved something even Kakashi found impossible, adding lightning release to the Rasengan, thus creating the vanishing variation. This is why Sasuke mentions Boruto's potential, declaring he would one day surpass Naruto and understood that all he needed was somebody there to believe in him. After all, Sasuke was in a similar boat as his father often diminished his achievements in favor of Itachi Uchiha. Thus, he gives Boruto his old headband as a vote of confidence, something that will be fundamental for the rest of the series. Using Sasuke's Rinnegan, the Kage and Boruto travel to the realm where Momishiki has held Naruto captive. The other Kage attempt to fight them, but you all know what happens. Their father, they get wasted. It's embarrassing. It's, it's pretty difficult to put into words how disgusted I am. Yeah, they're useless. So Naruto and Sasuke are left to take on a fused Momoshiki, giving us the coldest fight in Shonen history. It was fire! However, let's not forget, this series is called Boruto, so naturally, he would join in. Using his brand new technique, the Vanishing Rasengan, he's able to land a direct hit on Momoshiki, right when it looked like everyone was doomed. With the help of Naruto's massive Rasengan, Sasuke's Rinnegan, and Boruto's pure eye, he is able to land the finishing blow to Momoshiki. However, things aren't that simple in this show. After killing him, Momoshiki tells Boruto that those who kill gods can't remain ordinary humans. Those blue eyes will one day take everything from you, as he looks into his future and prophecy. As we know, it's here that Momoshiki also bestowed the karma onto him so that he could resurrect in his body as this marking on the palm of his hand acts as an anchor for the soul of the Utsuski who implanted it. Over time, the karma seal would slowly begin to overwrite the host's DNA, replacing it with Momoshiki's until one day, Boruto would cease to exist completely. Before then, however, there were two ninja he now knew he had to dispose of in order for them to achieve his goal of creating the god tree. Naruto and Sasuke. In spite of the looming threat hanging above them and on the entire planet, it was still time for celebration and reflection as Boruto had finally unearthed the path he wanted to walk down, defying what fate had presented him with. Whilst initially only wanting to know about his father's past as a means to surpass him, Boruto becomes genuinely curious about Naruto's history as he asks his father about it, particularly about how he has become one of the strongest shinobi ever to live, despite seemingly being utterly hopeless in everything else. From this battle against Momoshiki, Boruto ultimately came to see his father in a new light, both admiring his might as a shinobi, yet still having such an equally selfless nature to protect the village. Afterwards, he and Naruto were able to find common ground and have a healthy relationship again, pushing each other towards their goals. Naruto and and Sasuke comment how despite the different era, the soul of a shinobi remains the same. Boruto now acknowledges his own desire to be a shinobi and the newfound respect for his actual hard work. However, he has no intention to become Hokage as he believes that it's a one-way track for him to simply follow in the footsteps of his dad and Minato. Thus, he looked Sarada dead in the eye, declaring his intention to become a shinobi like Sasuke one that would watch over the Hokage and stand by her side. Tsurada was completely raised up from that moment. She fell in love and will become his future wife. But now, let's move on to the Mitsuki arc. 
Sometime after this event, Boruto then encountered the previous Suchikage, Onoki. The old man asked him if he knew what the hardest rock in the world was, in which he revealed to be the bedrock inside of him, meaning Boruto's indomitable will. This was an important arc to determine how far Boruto would go for his loved ones, as Miski became a missing nin, as well as bolstering his resolve to defy the destiny Momoshiki bestowed. Onaki stated, No matter what the adversity, your bedrock never shatters. No matter what hardships or sorrow you face from now, never discard your bedrock, your will. This helped Boruto continue to evolve as a shinobi. He faced his problems head on and chased his friend down, much like his father before him with Sasuke. This was his means to grow and learn more about Mitsuki's feelings, which would later play a role in his maturity by the way, as he doesn't blame Kawaki's emotions in chapter 80 regarding the situation, but rather himself for leaving him no choice and wants to save him. Kawaki was someone who would rather be dead than alive when they first met but his emotions pushed him to save the world through his own means. The arc taught Boruto that Mitsuki's recent actions and curiosity was wanting to connect with people that were more like him, as emotions are what make humans special with their free will. Boruto accepted his apology and admitted that he was glad that he got the chance to better understand him as a person, hoping to learn more about each other. These traits as a shinobi would later prove to be vital Trust me bro, it got pretty damn bad for him. But it's another reason why he proudly announces in the time skip that he is still a shinobi. By this time, Boruto had become more mature. So when the new tradition Naruto created called the Parent and Child Day was invented, where shinobi have to hang out with their children for a day, Boruto instead gave up this opportunity to Himawari to have a touching bond with Naruto instead. His maturity shines throughout this arc, as Boruto found to his surprise that Sasuke had returned to the village. He explained the situation of the new holiday and decided to back off on training with Sarada so she could enjoy the holiday with Sasuke. Sarada was getting embarrassed and annoyed by Sasuke's naive attempts to bond with her, like Sasuke was calling her, yo my peanut, my brat. <laughs> He actually went to Kakashi of all people to get advice. Kakashi's not even married or has kids. That's so funny. But as Boruto meets Sarada again after these embarrassing moments, he pointed that neither of them really know much about each other, but rather should just enjoy the time together. Ultimately, Boruto's advice helped the Uchiha duo reconnect and in gratitude, Sarada told Boruto his own advice of just being more casual with his own father. That night, Boruto received a custom shuriken as a present from Naruto and the two decided to train together together for the remainder of the evening, showcasing that father and son love each other more than ever. This wasn't the only important growth in Boruto's character, as in the Jugo arc, he was hit with a harsh truth of learning the concept of predestination. We all know Jugo loves animals, especially birds. He has sage transformation and is constantly in touch with nature. But a Walmart Orochimaru appears wanting to take advantage of him using his genes to spread misery? Of course! In this arc, Boruto encounters a goose that has been domesticated by the villagers, and because of its upbringing over generations, it has lost the ability to fly compared to other birds. This is because they no longer migrate, thanks to their predetermined genetics. Boruto, in his naivety, expresses his desire to see the bird fly. This is because Boruto is someone who wants to carve out his own destiny that isn't decided for him and so he sees himself in the goose. Remember that moment Shiki stated to him that you have inherited strong Atsushi genetics which made him a perfect vessel and giving him his destiny in the first place. So despite having a prophecy he cannot escape, he wants to challenge and change the unfair aspects of the world, something that infuriated Momoshiki in chapter 
1979. In the Naruto universe, not all human beings are born equal. For instance, if you were born into the Ishia clan, you won the goddamn lottery. You're automatically gifted with powerful eyes that no one else can possess. If you were born in Sakura's clan or, you know, Keeper's clan, you're gonna be pissed off. So during this arc, Boruto discovers the birds are infected with a cursed seal and they are making the villages around sick, transforming into dangerous creations. However, Boruto conveys to Jugo that if everything is solely based on genetics, it wouldn't be any fun at all. After all, Boruto had it hammered into him that hard work is the essential part of being a shinobi. In spite of that, Jugo explains that no matter how much effort you put in, some paths are predetermined, as is the case with Jugo himself, who hails from a clan that forces him to undergo transformations he cannot control. No one else possesses the same transformation ability he suffers from, and as a result, Jugo leads a a more challenging life than most. Nevertheless, Boruto will forever stick to what he believes in regarding hard work, which lays the groundwork for the rivalry that spawns between him and his brother. He has an amazing speech in this arc. Play the clip. <laughs> Now this Walmart version of Orochimaru takes on Jugo's power and he has a fight with them resulting in a situation like this which I found hilarious. And then Boruto beats his ass down with a Rasengan saving the entire day. The sun comes up and Sarada prepares to kill the birds that this madman created as they carry a disease. Mitsuki stops her and Konohamaru arrives with Sugetsu, showing her the serum to neutralize the cursed seal they stole from the enemy's base. Sugetsu consumes the serum, merging with the lake water and rains it down on the birds, curing them. The domesticated goose struggle, but they then finally manage to fly with the wild ones, foreshadowing that Boruto would defy his destiny. Things soon turned sour again when the Otsutsuki returned to wage war. This time, Urashiki was leading a one-man army to finish what Momoshiki started. He hunted down Shukaku, the one-tail, planning to work his way through all nine beasts. In order to do this though, he had to chase down Boruto and Shinki, who was escorting Shukaku to Konoha for safety. This was another one of the very few times we witnessed Boruto's pure eye. And we weren't the only ones, as Shinki also became the first to see it in person. Still hasn't told anyone about it though. It's thanks to the Jogun that Urashiki got all pissy, as Boruto could see through all of his tricks thanks to the eye's ability to see through space-time to discern where Urashiki's portals would appear from before they did. Boruto even managed to break Urashiki's horn. He quickly made a run for it though when Uncle Sasuke appeared, as he knew he was about to get his ass well and truly whooped. In the pursuit of keeping Earth safe from Urashiki, Boruto and Sasuke then time traveled to the past. I'm blocking you. That was the dumbest shit I heard all day. Being the bum he is, Urashiki chickened out from facing a prime Naruto and instead used a magic alien turtle device to travel back in time and pick a fight with the child. Are you not ashamed of yourself? Bear in mind, he almost got his ass beat by two kids in the present day already. He literally had to go serious by activating his two Rinna Sharingans against a Geni, quite fittingly giving him the name Trashiki. This thing is trash! But like I said, this was all possible thanks to a magic alien artifact belonging to the Otsutsuki clan, reaching a power much like their space-time dojutsu, but instead of jumping through space, it can literally bring out a portal to the past. Once this turtle was opened by Urashiki, it proceeded to give him information about the timelines. This heavily links with the other statements to Teneri, that the main branch of the family has already seen everything that has happened in the past and are upset about the events in Naruto's last movie. This gives context to Urashiki going to the moon to seal Teneri away for 10,000 years as he was indirectly helping Boruto with his dreams, rebelling against the main branch of the clan. Because of this, Urashiki took a sneak peek into Boruto's future, declaring that he was a threat. Ancient tools such as this turtle and eyes like Ada's Senragan allow them to see dimensions and far distances of time to understand what is going on around the galaxy. And so, going back 21 
years, Urashiki plans to take the Ninetales away from Naruto. Since the Tailed Beasts are the greatest form of Chakra Balls on planet Earth, he would cultivate them all in this timeline and then travel back to the present. However, Sasuke and Boruto manage to get a whiff of what Trashiki is up to and manage to hop along for the ride back in time. But to prevent any butterfly effects from happening, they could not interfere with the people they're close to or change too much, as the future will end up completely different. Boruto says this is easy, but... Mission failed! We'll get him next time. Through this journey, Sasuke once again takes the role in guiding Boruto through their mission, from finding disguises to even explaining to Boruto how this is a perfect opportunity for coming to an understanding with his father. On the topic of learning the past, Boruto, who actually follows the same fate as his sensei, arrived at the moment in time where young Sasuke had already gone rogue and left the village. Prior to this, Sasuke had left hints about his own past to Boruto, but avoided the topic. For example, he mentioned to Boruto that there was once a man he refused to heed to the words of others and sought power for himself. Boruto eventually discovers the truth that Sasuke left the village and confronts him about it, but acts really mature about the situation as he's learning the two paths that his father and sensei took. He has learned how Sasuke chose power to get revenge against his brother who took his family away from him to cut ties with another and Boruto has also learned about Naruto's struggle and what he had to go through to bring his friend back whilst being lonely. Now Boruto's story is both of them. He has everything right now, but will lose it all due to his prophecy, putting him in Naruto's shoes as the village outcast. But he will also parallel Sasuke as the outlaw. The difference is that he won't seek out power to kill the brother that took his family away from him, but instead, thanks to witnessing what Naruto experienced, will have reason to understand Kawaki's perspective. Sasuke explains that at the time, he felt like he had no other choice, but Boruto believes that people can change as Sasuke Sasuke is evidence of that. Overall, these little lessons bolster Boruto's Nindo that he develops later on, as we all know when he declares to Kawaki that the Age of Shinobi isn't over. They eventually defeat Trashiki to save both past and present Naruto, which is when Jiraiya drops the bombshell that he knew all along that Sasuke was from the future and that Boruto is Naruto's son. Knowing the adverse effect this could have on the timeline, Sasuke uses his Sharingan to delete everyone's memories, much to the the surprise of Naruto at the time. They then continue back to the present day and pretend none of this ever happened. However, we see from episode 139 that after further seeing the power of the Yotsutsuki, some wiser words from Ibiki come back to Boruto. No one is able to overcome their fears. This reminds him of his dreaded prophecy from Momoshiki, one that was approaching faster than Boruto would have hoped for. As the reoccurring theme of betrayal continued in the Majina Bandits arc. Following a mission that included him infiltrating Hozuki Castle, the same prison Naruto went to in the Road to Naruto movie, Boruto met Kokuri, a man being targeted from within the prison as a former member of the Majina Bandits, a group of rogue ninja from across the globe conducting illegal activities. Kokuri was their former accountant, thus he had intel on the organisation which the leader, Shijoji, did not want getting into the wrong hands. Thus he used his jutsu to take over the body of Sukio, another Mujina Bandits member that was sacrificed for his disguise. Team 7's goal was to help free Kokuri, and so they all bonded with each other during their escape. However, Kokuri never made it out of the prison despite Boruto believing he did. This is because in their battle with Sukio, Team 7 succeeded in defeating him by blasting him into the ocean off a cliff edge. However, on his way down, he took Kokuri with him. Whilst under the water, Sukio ate him, which triggered Shijoji's jutsu, allowing him to take over his body and emerge from the sea seemingly safe, meaning he could escape the prison with Team 7. Because of this, Boruto had let the enemy free whilst also losing a close friend at the same time without even realising it. He got his revenge though, as when Shijoji tried to kidnap the Daimyo's son, Boruto was there to save him, despite the two not hitting it off at all, with Boruto probably thinking it was like looking in a mirror at his old bratty self. This is because Tento would take the easy way out of everything, using money as a means to get what he wanted. Furthermore, he even tried to get Boruto to force him into shinobi training by offering him a super rare Sasuke trading card. This was because Tento dreamt of becoming a shinobi as a means to get his dad's attention, much like Boruto. However, he sucked at it, and would quickly give up 
considering this was something that actually demanded hard work and couldn't just be solved by throwing money at it. Do you know what can be solved by throwing money at it though? Being sleepy. That's right, have you ever felt tired whilst gaming, reading manga, going gym, watching Boruto? Of course you have! And so, you really need some gamer subs. It's healthy and helps you with your focus. Honestly, you might have noticed that this video is pretty long and it took a hell of a lot of work. But it wouldn't have been possible without gamer subs and they're a super long-term partner of the channel so please check them out and don't forget to use our code ABD for 10% off. And if you're not sure whether or not you'll like it, you can literally try it for free. They'll just send it to your address and bada bing bada boom, you've got the good stuff. Anyway, thanks to Boruto's training and encouragement though, after relating to his problems, Tento eventually hit the target with his shuriken. Spending time with Boruto had truly strengthened his resolve, as even after being held for ransom, Tento went to kill himself with a shuriken rather than let the enemy get their way. Luckily, he didn't have to go that far, as Boruto ended up saving him in the end anyway. Before he could defeat Shijoji though, the karma seal on his palm activated for the very first time, riddling the young ninja with pain, putting an end to his attacks. Just the sight of the karma seal alone sent shivers down Shijoji's spine as he immediately believed Boruto was a member of Kara. Being stricken with fear though gave Sarada and Mitsuki the chance to subdue him so that he could be sent to Konoha for severe questioning by Ibiki. However, when he couldn't get anything out of him, they sent in the big gun. A man not afraid of doing things the law wouldn't be too fond of to get what he wants, Sasuke Uchiha. It was here that he learned about the secret Kara organization. Boruto continued his training under Sasuke, excelling in the shuriken jutsu, where he asked his sensei questions about his newly acquired karma seal. However, he's told not to rush into the unknown and instead stay focused on missions like an ordinary shinobi. Boruto promised to do exactly that after being assigned a missing person mission in the land of valleys. The man they were searching for was Anato, a researcher for Victor's company who had lost control of himself after coming in contact with the Hashirama cell. Yep they're still lying around. This Victor lad was actually a member of Kara, so as you can imagine, he was up to no good. He wanted to make a new man-made god tree. Seriously, is this the only thing bad guys do nowadays in Naruto? They're not even villains anymore really are they? They're just gardeners. Anyway, he took fragments from the dead god tree after the war ended, nurturing it with the Hashirama cell and various test subjects, ultimately sacrificing the people in the land of valleys to produce a chakra fruit. And so it was in this art that us and Boruto learnt about the war-torn conflict that still plagued the smaller states outside of the five great nations from Mugino. This was Boruto's first taste of life as a shinobi of old. Despite learning the lessons people like his father had to endure on a day-to-day -day basis, this was Boruto's first time experiencing it. He learned about the disparity between the rich and poor and how different life was like outside of his own comfort zone, allowing him to realise just how lucky he was after seeing the lengths people would go to to survive, even abandoning or their pride as, at the end of the day, you can't pay your bills with it. However, Boruto's true development came after experiencing complete and utter humiliation in his battle against the Kara member Deepa, who was working alongside Victor with the secret god tree plan going behind Jigen's back. Thus, he broke the forbidden rule of anime and stopped the main character's theme song midway. <laughs> This was the moment Boruto felt true despair for the first time as he helplessly watched as both he and his friends got destroyed by an opponent that was way beyond their level. It was a truly humbling experience for him. However, he reacted positively as Deeper became the catalyst Boruto needed for him to push on and take his training to the next level, helping him understand that he wasn't as powerful as he might have realised. And so, when a normal Rasengan doesn't do the trick, there's only one man to visit, Kakashi Sensei. The fact Kakashi came out of retirement and took Boruto into train is a testament to how far he had come in terms of his attitude, and proof that by this point in the story, he had become a proper shinobi like his father. Talking of Naruto, Boruto wanted to learn the giant Rasengan, but was told it would be impossible for him. Thus, Kakashi taught him to add his speciality, wind style, instead. Now, whilst in Naruto's case this created the Rasen Shuriken, it was different for Boruto, as he ended up with a smaller green variant, which unfortunately was not good enough for him to seriously level up. 
help. But that's when his friend Shikadai came in to aid Boruto train, giving him the idea to rather than create a large destructive Rasengan, instead focus on breaking a single point in Deeper's armor. Thus, Boruto was inspired to go small in order to do big damage, giving birth to what we now know as the Compression Rasengan. Creating one unique Rasengan was impressive enough, but in the space of just a few days, Boruto had created two more, prompting Kakashi to once again point out his talent, comparing him to that of the fourth Hokage. And so it was time for round two. Boruto, Sarada and Mitsuki focused on getting their revenge against Deeper, whilst Orochimaru handled Victor and the God Tree. With Team 7 back together again though, stronger than ever both physically and mentally, they fought an equal battle against Deeper. However, he soon activated his trump card by using his carbon manipulation jutsu to create armor made of diamond. This near indestructible defense however proved to be worthless in front of Team 7's combined compression Rasengan. This powerful jutsu backed by Mitsuki Sage Mode Chakra and Sarada's help saw them obliterate deeper and secure the dub. However, a new power would begin to brew within Boruto, as his karma seal was about to take center stage, further evolving during Team 7's fight against Ao, where it fully activates. It grants him thousands of years worth of fighting experience from Momoshiki, putting him immediately in the upper echelons of Shinobi history. Meanwhile, Jigen, the leader of Kai Kara calls for a meeting, telling the gang to get their sh** together as the vessel is missing. Elsewhere, Boruto is defeated in a spa by Naruto, who was wielding a ninja tool which pisses Boruto off. This is when Batman Sensei comes to calm him down and tells Boruto that it's not about the actual usage of the tool that's inherently good or bad, but rather the application of it. Sasuke's point is hammered home even more following a mission given to Team 7 from Naruto regarding escorting Katasuke to another lab. On the train to their location, they meet Ao, who realizes that Boruto is is upset about the idea of scientific ninja tools, but proves Sasuke's point by threatening him with a screwdriver, stating that it itself isn't evil, but only the people who use them can decide what the tools do. The squad then arrives at Katasuke's research facility where they meet the lead scientist Akita Inazuka. Now despite Boruto wanting to act like he doesn't care for the scientific ninja tools because of his past, a kid will always be a kid. If he hadn't warmed to the idea of technology yet though, Boruto sure was about to as nobody can resist a cute dog story. Enter Chamaru, Akita's partner. She used to be an active shinobi in the past but during a mission Chamaru lost his right hind leg. However, Sasuke made a prosthetic limb as soon as he had heard of what happened, helping Boruto realize that ninja technology does have its benefits if used correctly. Boruto then gets his hands on a prototype chakra blade, doing his finest Luke Skywalker cosplay. It doesn't last very long though, as this blade drains the user's chakra at a rapid rate, which ends up being a blessing in disguise a little later on. Before we get ahead of ourselves though, Naruto contacts Team 7 and tells them that he has lost contact with both Konohamaru and Mugino who were out investigating a crashed airship, assigning them a new mission to investigate what happened. Once they find Trashamaru and his friend, they are instantly encountered by Ao who straight up robs them at gunpoint for intel about the mystery container in the airship. Mugino sacrifices himself to stop Ao as the cave they're in collapses in on them. Now whilst Team 7 manages to get away in a nearby abandoned building, it's safe to say Boruto did not take this death well. He grew to respect Mugino and learned the many trials and tribulations that come with the not so glamorous side of being a shinobi. He also became his close friend as Boruto would even visit his home and care for his pet turtle when he wasn't there. And so he felt helpless knowing that there was nothing he could do to help him in the end. Boruto knew that it was now his responsibility to carry out Mugino's will but he didn't know if he had what it takes. As they discuss tactics on how to beat Ao, Katasuke steps up and shares about how guilty he feels for having leaked intel as well as enabling someone like Ao to misuse the technology he originally meant for good. But Boruto finally stands up and tells him that after visiting the lab and seeing how many people it has helped, it's changed his perspective on the importance of scientific ninja tools and now accepts their place in the world. And that is why Boruto is intent on using them to beat Ao who finally finds them. Boruto showcases his S tier ninja skills and strikes from above with the chakra blade where Ao manages to grab it, using it to stab Boruto. 
However, this was all part of the Young Lord's genius. The Boruto that Ao stabbed was just a shadow clone, and knowing how the blade severely drains one's chakra, Boruto purposefully left Ao snatch it so that he could land his finishing blow. It's following this bout that Boruto brings it full circle, as he points to the screwdriver at Ao's neck. The veteran shinobi tells Boruto to kill him and avenge Mugino. These words trigger Boruto, who proceeds to stab the screwdriver directly into the ground. He leaves it by Ao's side so that he can repair his arm and leg, showing mercy to him which Ao notices, claiming Boruto to be just like his father. Which is true, as Ao is then hit with the finest talk no jutsu. Boruto reminds him that he is not just a tool to be used by other people, but in fact his own person who can use what he has been given for the well-being of others like Boruto. After all, it depends on how the tools are used. Boruto didn't train and try and get stronger just so that he could kill people who can't fight back. He tells Ao that as long as he can stand and walk with the limbs that Katasuke gave him, he should never give up on living. But he dies 30 seconds later anyway. That's right, enter Kashin Koji, a man who would unknowingly change the course of Boruto's story. After defeating Konohamaru, Koji recognized Boruto's karma and was surprised that he was chosen by Momoshiki. Koji then has a change of plans. He thanks Team 7 for showing them something interesting to him and proceeds to leave the area, giving them a chance to escape. Our heroes believed that everything was over, but little did they know it was only just beginning, as they encountered the boy who would later to bring chaos to Konoha. Kawaki. Kawaki's introduction into the series is one fans had known was coming for a long time from the two's eventual fight over the runes of Konoha. But what nobody expected was for Boruto and Kawaki to become brothers. What? <laughs> yep, after Kawaki's revealed to be the secret package that Ao was after, it's here where we learn that Kawaki also has a karma, which starts to resonate with Boruto's as he makes quick work out of the outer Kara member Gado. This fight takes a lot out of Kawaki, who passes out. The theme of science and technology follows, with Katasuke noting how Kawaki's entire body has been biologically modified and is simply a work of art. Either way, Boruto and Team 7 take the liberties by bringing Kawaki back to Konoha as he is linked to Kara. However, after a history of emotional and physical abuse, Kawaki distrusts others, so he tries to quickly bounce out of there until he meets the GOAT Naruto. With many attempts to escape, Kawaki eventually gave up and decides to call Naruto his daddy. After this adoption, we see Baruto struggle with his own karma and fate, especially since the resonation. However, Kawaki being wary of others pushes any advances Baruto can even make, which eventually causes a fight between the two. Like our boy Naruto is just trying to take a piss, but his two sons just ain't letting that happen. After taking their frustration out on each other, other, Boruto tries one more time to understand Kawaki and break the barriers between them. Kawaki does open up, but it kind of gets depressing as Boruto has to listen to Kawaki's own daddy issues and wishes to die as a result of being a vessel for an abusive alien in Jigen. But this brings out a commonality between the two, which is hatred for the karma and the Otsutsukis. So the two decide to work together in the pursuit of getting rid of it once and for all. Kawaki being trained in how to use his karma from a young age gives Boruto a quick rundown on the basics. This further builds their brotherly bond as Boruto finally starts to better understand his karma and how it can be used as a powerful weapon. He would train with Kawaki often, both using their karma so that Boruto could master the power. As the two brothers end their bout with the shinobi unison sign, Boruto's karma resonates even further, showing Momoshiki's spirit that is lingering inside of him. The brotherhood between the two solidifies in stone when Delta infiltrates Konoha to bring Kawaki back to Jigen. However, she was met with the goat Naruto, and though he made quick work out of her during this battle, she put Himawari in danger. However, Boruto's newfound brother saved her and took a direct hit from Delta's laser beam. <laughs> 
to Boruto, this showed how much Kawaki actually cared about his new family. As not too long before, he broke Himawari's handmade wasp. And though he tried to put it back, there was still a piece missing, which represented Kawaki's own heart. However, Kawaki realized that this empty hole was being filled by Naruto and his family. So he was willing to give up his entire life for this, as it was the first time he felt he belonged. But sadly, Boruto's happy family life doesn't last long, as this failed attempt by Delta triggered Jigen himself to make his presence and take matters into his own hands. Fine. I'll do it myself. Whilst Boruto was away in his quest to seek Tsunade to inquire about the similarities of the karma and the strength of a hundred seal, his house was invaded by Jigen. He tries to take Kawaki by force, who tells Jigen he will come as long as he doesn't fight his new daddy, fearing for his life if he were to fight Jigen. But Naruto and Sasuke just ain't having it, and so Jigen takes them to a separate realm where they duke it out. Yeah, we all know how that ended. <laughs> You can't keep getting away with it! After learning that Naruto was trapped, Boruto with the help of Kawaki manages to use their karma in unison and is then able to open a portal to Naruto's location. With Sarada and Mitsuki joining, it's here where they encounter Boro, another inner member of Kara. However, their teamwork was put on full display as each member played an integral part in destroying Boro's core. The dub was seemingly in the bag as they finally saved Naruto. But Boro returns in his finest Ursula cosplay, turning Boruto into a Wakamo. This of course pressed buttons that shouldn't have been pressed. As the next thing, you know, Boruto is flying in the sky. Oh wait. <laughs> That's not Boruto, it's Momoshiki. The chakra fatigue from the fight put Boruto in a vulnerable position, which Momoshiki snatched up to possess his body. He borrowed a little bit of chakra from Naruto and proceeded to use his overwhelming power to kill Boruto using a giant Rasengan. The same attack that stopped him all the way at the start of the series. However, the use of this technique established how Momoshiki was learning the fundamentals of ninjutsu through Boruto, something that would otherwise be a foreign concept to the Otsutsuki. And so, Momoshiki repays the young lord by reminding him that his entire life will turn to shit. Anyways, as the gang returns back home, the drama doesn't seem to end with the news of Shikadai being held hostage by Amado. It's here where Amado reveals he wishes to defect to Konoha, and in return for this, he will tell them everything he knows about Jigen, Kara, the Ten Tails, and the Otsutsukis. With Naruto and Sasuke back on their feet, Boruto and the gang hear Amado's revelation on how Kara's goal is to cultivate a chakra fruit and create a new god tree. To do this, they would need to feed the Otsuskis to the Ten Tails, with Boruto being top of the list for candidates. Amado further relays a transmission that showcases his test team clone of Jiraiya fighting Jigen. And it's during this, Amato lore dumped so astronomically <laughs> that Kishimoto could probably write a whole novel on it. Amato reveals that Jigen's true identity is Ishiki Otsutsuki, the other clan member who descended upon the planet with Kaguya. Each Otsutsuki travels in pairs, where one would be sacrificed to the god tree in order to complete its growth, but not before they implant a karma on a chosen host to prevent their ultimate death. Sasuke also reveals the Otsutsuki mural he came across, where it showcased three pairs and six Otsutsukis, and he also got a glimpse of a living ten-tailed seedling. Ishiki was the head of his pair, however for whatever reason Kaguya betrayed him, leaving him on the brink of death, and so this guy used his ability to shrink down and went into a nearby monk's air. <coughs> This poor man was called Jigen. He wasn't a bad guy, but sadly, just a puppet. And I mean literally. Ishiki had been feeding out of his brain to then control his neural receptors and eventually his entire body. Jigen had to live through all of this whilst not being able to do anything. Ishiki then imparted his karma on Jigen in hopes to fully revive. However, Jigen's body was imperfect as it wasn't strong enough to bear his full power. Hence the reason Kawaki is so important to 
him is because he is a perfect vessel, someone Ishiki could fully resurrect in permanently. However, Kawaki along with Baruto were only 80% Otsutsuki at this point, and the karma extraction process had not fully completed. So as Amato continues his lore dump, Kashin Koji successfully forces Ishiki to resurrect into his imperfect vessel Jigen, which in turn removed Kawaki's karma and freed him from Ishiki's control. This means that Ishiki only has two to three days to re-implant his new karma on Kawaki before he ceases to exist. So he quickly finishes Koji, forcing him to barely escape alive and heads to Konoha. After slapping the shit out of the strongest members of Konoha, the GOAT steps in. But yeah, he, he gets slapped up too. <laughs> Whilst this is ongoing, Baruto resolve is tested by his sensei, as Sasuke tells him that he and Naruto weren't even able to leave a dent on Jigen, so they will need his help. He questions if Baruto is ready to die for his village. However, though Baruto is more than ready like any good ninja would be, Baruto is still worried that he might lose consciousness to Momoshiki again, and wonders if it's right for him to be blessed with such a burden from his sensei. In spite of that, Sasuke promises that as his master, he will be the one responsible for killing him if needs be. With this reassurance, Baruto requests his sensei's headband one more time, ready to charge into battle with his life on the line. With their new resolve together, Baruto and Sasuke manage to trick Ishiki and teleport him out of Konoha. But this doesn't stop Ishiki from giving the lot the biggest beatdown they ever received. In fact, had it not been for Baruto and his compression Rasengan, Sasuke would have been killed. <laughs> Much like Tenta earlier, Boruto tries to use himself as a trump card by pointing a kunai to his throat, knowing Ishiki needs him as a sacrifice for his plans. This re-establishes Boruto's resolve and the conversation he had with Sasuke earlier. However, Ishiki just shrinks that kunai and proceeds to snap Boruto's arm until his daddy Naruto appears. But this time, Naruto is different. Kurama understanding the impossible situation, he offers him a way to overcome Ishiki. Barian mode. This power gives Naruto an insane boost by burning Kurama's own life force along with the life force of his opponent. Using this form, Naruto is able to diminish Ishiki's remaining lifespan down to just a few minutes. This caused him to panic, but luckily for him, he senses Waki through Naruto's artificial arm that he had been given. Ishiki teleports him to their location and quickly plants a karma seal in his final moments. But Kawaki gets the last laugh, as it turns out to be a shadow clone. Completely outsmarted, Ishiki faces his death at Kawaki's hands. However, just as things are calming down, Boruto is possessed by Momoshiki and stabs Sasuke's Renin gun. No! Now it's just a Renin gun. <laughs> Momoshiki reveals that with Ishiki dead, he can feed Kawaki to the Ten Tails to cultivate his own chakra fruit, finishing what he started. Knowing this, like his brother Baruto, Kawaki builds the resolve to sacrifice himself by burning in his own fire jutsu, leaving Momoshiki with two choices. Number one, watch his only god fruit sacrifice die in front of his very eyes. Or number two, absorb the fire using the karma and risk giving Baruto control of his body once again. That's right, he gambled and failed, as Baruto now with chakra in his body regained consciousness and snapped that horn right off his head to regain complete control. This arc concludes with the death of Ishiki and Kurama, Sasuke losing an eye and most importantly, the revelation to their next biggest threat, Ishiki's number one simp, Code. Yep, he was the other potential vessel but wasn't completely compatible, leaving him with the rare white karma. This gave gave him all the power of the Otsutsukis with none of the drawbacks of being a vessel. And so he sets out on his quest to get revenge for Ishiki, who appeared right before him in his final moments to tell him to continue his will of eating the chakra fruit and conquering planets until he evolves to become an Otsutsuki god. Borto with Kawaki's encouragement teleports everyone back to Konoha, where we get another important scene between the two brothers. He tells Kawaki that 
he can do anything as long as his brother is by his side. Following the mission's success, Borto now has become quite a celebrity as he was applauded on TV for being the one to save the village, even garnering his own fan group. Borto then eventually heads out with Kawaki to their monumental spot of the Hokage Mount where they discuss code. With him becoming more Otsutsuki by the day, Kawaki suggests that Borto should implant his own karma on code. This way, Boruto can ditch Momoshiki and resurrect as his own person. However, the contrast between the brothers starts to reignite with one willingly sacrificing another to achieve his goal, where Boruto shows hesitation in such an approach. Regardless, the first step the two agree on is to defeat Code, as currently he has his limiters, which if removed would make him stronger than even Jigen. Meanwhile, the anime had showcased one of the darkest moments in Naruto's life. This is because he has to deal with two major issues. Number one, everyone was pressuring him to kill his own son. And number two, he was pretending to be strong. With Kuruma's death, everyone realizes Naruto isn't as strong as he used to be with Gara questioning if he has the will to kill Boruto before it becomes too late. Something Sasuke knew he would never be able to do. To make things even worse, Boruto's results come in, confirming that his otsutsufication is progressing faster every day where he will become an alien within a couple of weeks. During these times, Boruto can't get any sleep as he keeps having flashes of Momoshiki taking over his mind and body. He has PTSD that he will harm those he loves, but it's out of his control. To contrast this, Naruto at his lowest point completely breaks down to his best friend Sasuke, explaining how he let his son down and as father, he wasn't able to do anything. Naruto realizes that as Hokage, he has a responsibility for caring about the lives of the entire village, which should supersede his love for the one person being Borto, his son. The right and logical decision would be to put Borto down so that hundreds and thousands, honestly, the entire world can be saved from the impending disaster. As this realization sips in, Naruto's voice cracks as he cannot fathom the idea of killing his own son. This idea is of course in Sasuke's mind too, as he reveals the real reason he was nerfed. Sasuke admits that he couldn't bring himself to fulfill the promise he made to Boruto, where he would kill him if Momoshiki took control and he more than anyone understands what Naruto is going through. However, Sasuke Sasuke vows that next time, he will keep up his end of the bargain and try to kill Borto if he goes on a rampage. But then, things get serious as Naruto and Sasuke have an argument. Sasuke implores Naruto to tell the truth that Borto's death is on the horizon because the inevitable will happen either way, but Naruto, not being able to face reality due to his emotions clouding his judgment, says he will prevent it from ever happening as that's the duty of a parent. Regardless, Sasuke knows nothing is possible as his words are meaningless and that's when he tells him to accept that Kurama is gone forever and Naruto won't be able to achieve the things he has done before. Thus, Naruto consults his son, telling him the truth that he is the main protagonist now. Where Boruto pretends to keep a strong face, but in reality, he feels lonely and depressed as his fate is out of his own control. Naruto even reveals the entire world suggested killing Boruto, but being his father, he will never allow that to happen or let anyone tell him what to do, promising to protect the son he loves even if it ruins his reputation as the seventh Hokage. If it's for the sake of their child, a parent can call call forth amazing power, so Borto has nothing to worry about. <laughs> oh my god, are you crying? Oh no, it's just raining. Borto then asks Naruto if he can trust him, and that's when his nindo about never giving back on his word comes into play, which finally allows Borto to sleep in his arms peacefully, as he realized his father hasn't given up on him and truly loves him more than anything else in the world. But as Borto falls asleep, reality sets onto Naruto even more. The pressure, the darkness, the hopelessness, hits him like a truck. Naruto's mask of pretending to be strong in front of everyone finally comes off. He was playing this role as Hokage to not make people worry, but he himself is the most worried at all. Remember, this is Naruto's specialty. Remember that time when he told young Hinata that he never cries? But in reality, bro was crying every day because of how lonely he was, <laughs> you know? So this all leads to Naruto hyperventilating, similar to when he find out everyone wanted Sasuke dead 
dead in the Kage Summit are. The possibility that he has to do the unthinkable of killing his son is depicted with Naruto looking at his hands. But when all hope was lost, Sassi Amado arrives with a solution. The anti-Byakugan pills. These pills were created with the goal of weakening Ishiki as the Byakugan is directly linked to the Otsutsuki. Thus, by taking these pills, it would help Boruto suppress Momoshiki's everlasting presence. This works, but as you will soon see, it comes with a cataclysmic side effect which made Naruto's darkest nightmare a reality. Sometime later, due to his connection to Boruto and after having his arm reinstated by Amato, Kawaki is officially given his ninja headband and assigned to Team 7 for the foreseeable future. Thus, they begin their training to battle Code. But it doesn't go as planned, as Kawaki fails to see the point in the Shinobi way, claiming it would take too long to reach the required level of power to fight the Otsutsuki, opting instead to skip the basics and go straight into sparring. However, after everything Boruto has been through, he would never turn his back on his shinobi way. So he challenges Kawaki to a 1v1. The winner must follow each other's beliefs. And so they go head to head, with Boruto snatching the victory after Kawaki went to absorb a jutsu with a karma seal he no longer had. This was the moment Kawaki started to wonder if he relied on that power more than he liked to believe, a weakness that Amado sought to take advantage of planting the idea in his mind that he must have the karma in order for him to protect Naruto. And so, without the power of karma, Kawaki realizes the best thing he could do is go to code and sacrifice himself for Naruto's sake. So, with 80% of his DNA being Otsutsuki, Kawaki manages to utilize their technique of erasing his chakra and presence. Of course, Boruto can still sense him because of their affinity towards each other. But Kawaki manages to trick every elite shinobi in Konoha, including the Hokage himself. Leaving a shadow clone behind, he escapes through the forest where, as expected, he is approached by Code. Meanwhile, Boruto ignores Naruto's instructions to stay home and runs after his brother, knowing he is the only one who can find him and so catches up with Kawaki, saving him from his would-be kidnapper in Code who, not long before, was having a polite conversation about his plan for world domination or annihilation, I guess, you know. Kawaki had pleaded for his life to be the only price for Ishiki's death, but Code isn't having any of that. He wants the full pie. However, Boruto's interference makes his brother mad as all his efforts went to vain. Kawaki explains how he will do anything to protect their father, the Lord Seventh, even at the cost of his own life. This would actually be a dark for shadowing on what's to come. Boruto in response punches Kawaki in the face and tells him, fine, do whatever you want bitch. <laughs> and he understands how much he wants to protect their dad, but Boruto too has the right to do what he wants, which is to protect Kawaki. However, Boruto proceeds to get manhandled by Code, who ends up provoking him to use the full extent of Momoshiki's powers, which of course was a big ass mistake, because Code is a walking L. <laughs> False Deep Otsutsuki Boruto is now in the picture, and he reminds Code that he is just a bitch without his limiters removed. But Code reveals Feels Boruto is finally using Momoshiki's DNA properly with the years of his Otsutsuki experience that has bled into him. With Boruto dosing on those Amato pills, he's able to utilize the karma's full power to best of his abilities without Momoshiki taking over. However, this doesn't last long as Boruto gets a heart attack. Yep, don't do drugs, kids. Especially don't do drugs given to you by a sussy dude who smokes all day. Meanwhile, Naruto realizes that he is useless, so he decides to invent another new technique, the Wisdom of Age Sage Mode. With Shikamaru, he pursues his sons, believing he can make a difference. Which, uh, he was wrong. <laughs> Okay, let's rewind a bit. Before Naruto and Shikamaru arrived to the scene, Boruto's heart attack awakened Momoshiki's presence, who had stopped time for Boruto just as he had done when he implanted the karma. Momoshiki tells Boruto that Amado's drugs are just as useless as he is and proceeds to beat up Code, wanting Kawaki for himself, who is saved consequently by Wisdom Sage Naruto. Boroshiki finally decides enough is enough and attempts to kill Naruto, but he fails once more as Kawaki absorbs the giant 
Rasengan with his karma seal. Wait, what the fuck? How did he get his karma seal? That's right, Amado's sussy powers came into action and he had actually replanted the karma when he gave Kawaki his new arm. But this time, it serves only as a weapon to make Kawaki stronger. The two brothers battle once more, with Kawaki deciding the best way to deal with Momoshiki is by killing Boruto. Which, of course, Naruto isn't a very big fan of. <laughs> but since care. when <laughs> did his opinion <laughs> matter anyway? As I've said before, the show is called Boruto, not Naruto no more. Boruto is then able to regain temporary control of his body and tells Kawaki that it's time to enact their plan. And so, Kawaki stabs Boruto through the heart, killing him. <laughs> Got him. Okay, we, we all know he ain't dead. Momoshiki used the last 20% of his Otsutsuki genes to revive Boruto. The same 20% that was intended to fully resurrect him. Meaning Momoshiki can never respawn to the world as himself. <laughs> But Boruto now is no longer human and is instead 100% Otsutsuki. But this was nothing compared to what was coming next for our young lord though. Code returns to his base and Ada basically tells him he f***ed up and that she'll go with him to the leaf next time. Back in Konoha, the two brothers meet at the Hokage Mount, in which Kawaki still views Boruto's life as a threat to Naruto. Like, I've never seen anyone more salty about their own brother's survival than Kawaki right here, man. He will continue to do whatever it takes to protect Lord Seventh, as Naruto is the only thing that matters in his life. As Kawaki walks away, Boruto vows to prove Momoshiki was wrong about his prophecy, considering he now has a better grasp of Momoshiki's power, the drugs he was taking unnecessary. The only way Momoshiki can take over now is by breaking Boruto's resolve, which is easier said than done. Later, Sasuke apologizes to Boruto for not keeping his promise of killing him if Momoshiki ever took over, which required Kawaki to step in. Boruto insists that he and his bro were in agreement, but Sasuke stressed that whoever was responsible for killing him would be hated, thus keeping it from the public was necessary, especially as many already disapproved of Kawaki. Boruto attempted to return Sasuke's headband, but he refused, knowing it would help Boruto strengthen his resolve even more. But everything starts to change, as Momoshiki predicted. Code finally got his grubby hands on Amado with the help of Ada and Damon, and so his limiters have been removed. Nothing can stop him now. <laughs> Okay, no, nothing but Damon can stop him. <laughs> wait, 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 we ain't there yet. We wait, we ain't there yet. After realizing Code was a walking L, Ada ditches his ass and agrees to Shikamaru's offer to join them instead for a date with Kawaki Kun. When they arrive, Ada is assigned to live with the two brothers as they are the only ones not affected by her charm effect. I would like to live with Ada too. Stop! You violated the law. I didn't mean it, I meant time skip Ada. That's who I would like to live with. But before leaving for his new house setting mission, Hinata tells Boruto that she feels uneasy, as though this would be the last time they will see each other and that he will not be coming home again. However, Boruto promises that he will return no matter what. As he leaves, Momoshiki pays him a visit, saying, Boy, shut your mouth! You ain't returning nowhere! You are gonna lose it all. <laughs> Once he has, Boruto will lose his will to live, and in the moment, Momoshiki Shiki will take over and possess his body for eternity. Great plan. In spite of that, Boruto shouts back saying he will be the one to decide his own fate. That wouldn't stop Momoshiki being a nuisance though as he popped up again when receiving orders for their house sitting mission with Ada. Something both Kawaki and Sasuke also sense by the way. Queen Ada arrives, fl casually flying across Konoha, making the beginning of the most dangerous sleepover in Naruto history. As things are about to take a dark turn, it's here Boruto meets a Damon, Ada's little brother who's afraid that with them being Otsutsuki, Kawaki and Boruto pose a threat to his sister. And so he makes sure neither of them try anything as he effortlessly slaps all of them up. But how is this little brat one of if not the most powerful character in Naruto history? Well, that's that's because he was made from the DNA of the Otsutsuki god. I'ma say his name, Shibai. 
You see, after arriving in the village, Amado explains the truth about Shibai and Otsutsuki who destroyed countless planets, arriving on Earth millions of years ago before reaching the point of such divine power. He abandoned his physical body and transcended reality. Now, how did Amado obtain this body? Well, he has a history of that. He managed to get Jiraiya's DNA from the bottom of the ocean. Like, how do you even get that? The pressure of the ocean would crush any technology in the Naruto universe. Regardless, he took Shibai's DNA and used it to create Ada and Damon. This gave them otherworldly abilities beyond human comprehension called Shinjutsu. All of this sounds too crazy to be true for Boruto, which is when Momoshiki shows up and hits him with a community note stating that everything about Shibai is in fact real. At this point, their thoughts had begun to overlap, meaning they were living in each other's heads rent-free. Thus, Momoshiki shows him a trailer for what's about to happen, as Boruto witnesses a fragment of the future where all of his friends are hunting him down. It's kind of like the anime clickbaiting us with the time skip in the first episode, you know? It's just what Boruto's experiencing. Now he gotta experience the wait for the time skip. But this further showcases that Momoshiki's abilities are beginning to intertwine with Boruto. After all, he did state that he feels like he's beginning to gain control over it. As Boruto continues his house sitting mission, he keeps thinking back to the visions he saw. Eventually, their mind crosses once more with Momoshiki revealing he figured out the Shinjutsu Ada is using. But Boruto's interaction with his Otsutsuki friend alerts Kawaki to finally confront this. Boruto tries to lie saying Momoshiki isn't there, but Kawaki ain't having it. This solidified his resolve and so he came to the decision that Boruto gotta go. He is a threat to Naruto and for that reason he's gonna have to kill his ass again. But like a good son, he asks his parents permission before committing first degree murder. <laughs> for whatever reason, they aren't happy, so Kawaki sends them to the Gulag. Meanwhile, Boruto is left babysitting Damon, who senses the inner Gohan in Himawari. The news of Kawaki's actions finally reaches Boruto, who heads straight out to find his brother. But he doesn't have to look for long as Kawaki finds him first. The two brothers face off at the top of the Kagema, where they once had made their promise. Sarada, feeling lonely, decides to jump in as the next Hokage, she will save the day, right guys? No, nope, no, she, she won't. She won't because uh, Boruto gets cut in the eye trying to save her, leaving the scar we see during this time skip. Before Kawaki can go for the kill, the whole gang pulls up with Batman Sensei shutting down Kawaki's antics. However, Momoshiki's balls deep prediction jutsu has come true, so he possesses Boruto and helps Kawaki escape. Ada, feeling sorry for her future baby daddy, rushes to his aid, where he tells her he wishes things were different and that Momoshiki wasn't inside of his brother. The Kage's son as it would make things so much easier. All Kawaki wants to do is protect Naruto and the village that took him in, and deep down, even Boruto. If Momoshiki takes his body and kills his own father, Kawaki understands that would break Boruto's spirit even further, and he's now better off dead before that happens, just as they once promised. However, Boruto lying about Momoshiki was the straw that broke the camel's back. He is compromised already. This is Kawaki's worst nightmare. All this emotional trauma awakens Ada's true power of omnipotence, a power that allows her to alter anything she wants and rewrite history. After this moment, everyone besides those who are immune to Ada's power now view Kawaki as Naruto's biological son and Boruto as the villain. That's right, this series ain't called Boruto no more. This is Kawaki Naruto Next Generation. Everything that Boruto saw in Momoshiki's vision starts to play out in reality as he becomes a wanted rogue shinobi. His friends corner him, even the moon to his son in Mitsuki. As Boruto barely escapes, Sarada breaks down in tears. Our goat Sasuke is also affected by this sadly because of this overpowered hack's ability and is on his way to hunt Boruto, but Sarada stops him as she is unaffected. She begs her dad to save Boruto instead, activating the Manjutsu Sharingan. This encapsulates the full narrative of Boruto's story as it is exploring the cycle of love. After all, everything that has happened in the story stems from this. Kawaki loves Naruto, thus is doing what he's doing right now. Code loved Ishiki, which was the catalyst for his revenge plan and cultivating the god tree carrying out his will. Amado loved his daughter, doing anything to bring her back to life even if it meant aiding an alien in destroying the world. Ada desires love, but 
cannot have it. And lastly, Sumeria and Sarada are the only ones immune to omnipotence. The one thing they both of course share in common is of course their love for Boruto, which explains how Sarada has unlocked her Mangekyou despite not seeing anybody die or going into despair like other Uchiha. It's the love and care Boruto had for her that made him lose an eye. But in return, Sarada awakened hers. Witnessing this, Sasuke knows his daughter isn't lying, and after seeing Boruto wearing the headband he supposedly gave Kawaki, his resolution is firm. And so, he takes a trip down memory lane and abandons the village 20 years after the last time he did to become a criminal once again. Everything has come full circle, as Momoshiki's prediction does come true, but this whole journey to this point prepared him for this outcome. Boruto's resolve will not waver. Reflecting on Onoki's advice, no matter the adversity, you should never abandon your will. Because of this, he's able to endure these surreal experiences with optimism and actually feel for the people who caused them, knowing there was no true malice behind Kawaki's actions and hopes to settle things as brothers. Momoshiki is of course pissed by this, as this event was supposed to be Boruto's breaking point, but if anything, it made him even stronger, as we see the training with Sasuke has put to good use and bro, bro clapped up's coat, like he stepped on him. He came down out of nowhere, flying down, put his foot on Code's face and showed who's the boss. Boruto is him after part one. <laughs> and yep, that is Boruto part one fully explained. But to enjoy more peak fiction, check out our video on screen right now, where we go even deeper into Boruto and what the time skip will bring.